Okay, maybe we can start. And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our ABFER webinar series. And uh, this webinar series is jointly organized by uh, Becker Friedman Institute of China from University of Chicago and NUIS and then SAFE from Shanghai and Jiaotong University and the Department of Economics, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and also the School of Veterinary Economics um, from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Shenzhen. Uh, I will chair uh, today's uh, webinar. Uh, I'm Bo Hui Zhang from CUHK Shenzhen. So uh, I'm very glad today we are going to have a very interesting paper about uh, the legal system about China. The title of the paper is Law and Economics of Lawyers. And evidence from revolving door in China's judicial system. So the presenter is a shout out one from the uh, University of Chicago. So we will give 25 minutes to the presenter and also 25 minutes for the discussant later. And we will hope that we can keep 20 minutes for our free discussion. So shout out, you can start. All right, uh, thanks so much. For having me, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so this is John Tork uh, with John from HKU, Wenwei from Harvard, who's also here right now, and uh, Daniel from Duke. So basically, you know, ever since Adam Smith, generations of economists have always argued that a just and functioning judicial system is fundamental to a prosperous market economy. So not surprisingly, Different pieces of the judicial system have been studied extensively in the past, where we see tons of papers studying specific codes in law, by tons of papers studying uh, judge behavior, jury composition, court structure, so on and so forth. But if you look at that body of knowledge, we actually know surprisingly little about the roles of lawyers in shaping judicial economic outcomes, despite the perceived importance of the legal profession. Specifically, we don't really have a lot of evidence on whether lawyers matter in the sense that, you know, if you have a case, suppose you hire a really good lawyer versus a bad lawyer, whether that actually delivers different judicial outcomes. <clears throat> and if it does, then through what mechanisms? And there actually exists different schools of thoughts on this question. I think by summarized in this quote by Mark Twain. And so Mark Twain says that a good lawyer knows the law, a clever one takes the judge to lunch. And so a lawyer can function either through know how or through know who. And depending on which channel is more important, the implication of good lawyers for society could be vastly different. And theoretically, if you think about the societal impacts of a good lawyer, he can actually create two countervailing forces. Right? On the one hand, a good lawyer can generate positive externalities right? by presenting more convincing evidence, by presenting uh, compelling judicial reasoning, he can help the judge make more informed decisions. And that benefits everyone. So that's a positive externality. But at the same time, a good lawyer also creates a negative externality, right? Because he's being hired not to help the judge, but to help his own client. So he's going to do whatever he can <clears throat> using personal connections, using strategic presentation of evidence and judicial reasoning to try to sway the judicial result towards the direction that favors his client. And in a zero sum game like a lawsuit, this creates a negative externality on the other side. So the legal profession is a very rich setting, right? A lawyer can function through know how or know who, he can create positive and negative externalities. So theoretically, there are many different things going on, but empirically, we know very little about how lawyers actually operate and what they do to society. So what we do in this paper is that we try to study the law and economics of lawyers by focusing on a quite unique empirical setting, which is the revolving door between judges and lawyers in China's judicial system. Meaning that, you know, we see many judges in China quitting their jobs to practice as lawyers in private law firms. And by focusing on this group of lawyers, we try to say something more general about all high profile lawyers uh, in the society. So the first step of our project is a big data infrastructure that took us several years to complete. So basically, we analyze the more than 140 million court judgment files publicized on the Internet from which we're able to compile and link several novel data sets covering the universes of judges, lawyers, law firms, litigants, and lawsuits in China over the past decade. And from these data sets, we're able to identify 
more than 14,000 judges who quit their job during the past decade to practice as lawyers in private law firms. And that accounts for 6.6% .6 of all judges in the country and 2.6% uh, of all lawyers nationwide. And for every single one of those 14,000 revolving door lawyers, we basically observe every single detail about his professional life to the point of being borderline creepy. Right? So for example, you know, we see his entire performance as a judge, right? every case he ever handled, every court judgment file he ever wrote. We see his personal network, every colleague he ever had, every classmate he had uh, in graduate school. We see his entire career trajectory, how he progressed as a judge, how he transitioned into a lawyer, and then how he progressed as a lawyer. We see his performance as a lawyer, right? every case he ever argued, and importantly, we see his performance both in his home court, where he used to be a judge and has a lot of connection, and in his away courts, where he wasn't a judge and doesn't have as much connection. And we see his impact on his other lawyer colleagues, we see his impact on his employers, his clients, so on and so forth. So leveraging this novel data infrastructure, we're going to investigate the roles of lawyers in shaping judicial economic outcomes. And more broadly, this is also a unique opportunity to shed light on the operation of modern service industries more generally. So in today's talk, I'm going to be mainly discussing three sides of empirical results. So first, we're going to start with a very simple question, whether this really high profile revolving door lawyers actually deliver better judicial outcomes. And I'm going to try to convince you that the answer to this question is a resounding yes. So in otherwise identical lawsuits, Having a revolving door lawyer as opposed to an ordinary lawyer gives you much better rulings. And the way we identify this is that we focus on very well defined cases that can be clearly matched to each other. Specifically, we focus on two types of commercial lawsuits, loan contract disputes and sales contract disputes. So for example, if you think about a loan contract dispute, there are a few quantitative features that, de that define the entire case. You need to know the size of the loan, the interest rate, the repayment period, the punishment rate, so on and so forth. Right? Condition on those features being matched, you have two identical loan contracts. And we see millions of such identical loan contracts in the data. And then if it's a non-repayment issue, then you clearly have two identical loan contract disputes. And from a legal perspective, these two cases have very little difference legally, and there is very little legal ambiguity. But what we show is that even for those otherwise very similar cases, being represented by a revolving door lawyer would give you an additional win rate by 11 to 15 percent. So there's a massive return to hiring a good lawyer as opposed to an ordinary lawyer. And in some sense, this return is likely an understatement of lawyer effectiveness because we're focusing on the, on the least interesting cases with very little wiggle room. So you can imagine that you know, for the more complicated commercial or uh, criminal lawsuits, you know, the wiggle room for the famous lawyers to play their magic may be even larger. So basically the first part of the paper just shows that, you know, those revolving door lawyers deliver fantastic judicial outcomes. And then in the second part of the paper, we try to understand the mechanisms, right? Where does that premium come from? Specifically, we try to distinguish between know-how versus know-who. And the key test here is that we are going to be able to control for a very demanding lawyer fix effect and then compare within the same lawyer your performances at your home court where you used to be a judge and has a lot of connection and your performance at away courts where you wasn't a judge and didn't have a lot of connection. So this test is holding constant the level of know-how because it's the same person and it's just varying the level of know-who in different courts. And we're going to show that actually both know-how and know-who are very important in determining lawyer value, lawyer value added in this setting. And in our case, know-how and know-who seem to be complements rather than substitutes of each other. And then in the third part of the paper, we try to zoom out a little bit from this macro level impact of lawyers on their clients and think more broadly about the impacts of lawyers on the entire society. And we document that, you know, these good lawyers, they create this efficiency equity trade-off for the society. Where on the one hand, they present very good information and judicial reasoning which helps the judge make more informed decisions that makes otherwise identical cases get ruled more consistently. So that reduces the dispersion in rulings. But on the other hand, those revolving down lawyers, they sway the judicial results towards the direction that favors their clients by presenting strategic information, strategic argument. And that actually makes 
Otherwise, similar cases get ruled less consistently, so that increases ruling dispersion. And because these revolving door lawyers, they disproportionately serve the rich individuals and the big corporations, they also exacerbate existing social economic inequalities. Okay, so that's a trade-off that they create uh, for the society. So that's the main idea of the paper. And in the remainder of the talk, I'll first explain to you the institutional background and data construction, and then I'll talk about the three empirical tests, and then I'll conclude. Okay, so one minute version on China's judicial system. So in China, we have four layers of court, Supreme People's Court, and then provincial high courts, prefectural intermediate courts, and county basic court. When you have a commercial lawsuit, the first trial will typically be, uh, the, the case will be tried in the defendant's jurisdiction. And usually the first uh, trial will happen at the lowest county basic court level. But so, for some, you know, really high profile cases, the first trial could already happen at a higher level. And then after first instance, each party has one chance to appeal the decision. And that appeal will be handled by the corresponding next tier of court. And I think the important feature in this setting is that China mostly follows a civil law tradition. Uh, in the system, there is no jury, nor is there any legally binding president. So virtually all the important decisions are made by the local judges. But the judges are responsible for establishing key facts about the case. They're responsible for applying appropriate codes in law to the case. They're responsible for the ruling, for the sentencing, so on and so forth. So the quality of the judicial decision hinges almost entirely on the quality of the judges. Okay, so who are those local judges in China? So this slide basically shows you the typical career path of becoming a judge in China today. So you need to start by getting a law degree. Right? Most people do that in your early 20s. And then you need to pass the civil service, service, civil service exam, which qualifies you to work as a clerk in local court for three to five years. And during that period, you need to pass two more exams, the national judicial exam and the judge court exam. And having done all this, you're qualified to be appointed as a judge. So you can see that you know, if someone is really smart, ambitious, and lucky, then you can potentially become a judge at a very young age, which is what you see in China's judicial system these days, where the average judge age is about you know, in their late 30s. So you see a lot of those very young, well-educated judges who hold a lot of power in court, but at the same time, they're very poorly compensated. So this picture is taken by my co-author Zhuang in 2013, when he was conducting field work in a local court. So the last column of this picture shows you the monthly salary of all the local judges in that court. So you can see in 2013, the monthly salary of those judges were something like you know, 3,000 RMB, 4,000 RMB. So that's like you know, four or 500 US dollars per month. There was one guy earning 6,000 because that, that guy was the president of the local court. So they received very low compensation, especially when compared to their outside option, which is to practice as lawyers in private law firms. So this picture shows you from the same year, 2013, in the more developed parts of the country, Beijing, Shanghai, Zhejiang, and Guangdong, the average salary of lawyers in these places. And you can see the average lawyer earns five, six times higher salary than the average judges. And that is despite the fact that it's much easier to become a lawyer rather than to become a judge. But you only need to take a subset of the exams in order to become a lawyer. So this reversal between entry barrier and compensation makes it not super surprising that you know, over the past decade, we observe many judges in China quitting their judgeship to start practicing as lawyers in private law firms, which creates this revolving door problem in the judicial system. And so then can I ask a very quick clarification question? Yeah, please. Yeah, why, why, is the, why, why are the salary offers so low? I mean, it's compensating differential, right? You know, it's like, you know, in the US, judges also receive much lower salaries than lawyers, you know, because, you know, judges have prestige, they have job security, and they have intrinsic motivation. So it's like, you know, if Zhuge is not a professor, he can earn a lot more in a hedge fund, but he chooses to be a professor because, you know, there, there are different perks associated with this. So that's why, you know, despite this very big gap in, in salaries, uh, you, you see that, you know, about 7% of the judges quit. So still 93% of them decide to stay. So, so there are prestige and job security concerns here. Okay, so last year, you know, we conducted quite extensive field work about this. And uh, we, we, we have several observations in the field. One is that, you know, many of these resigning judges, they're considered as a key personnel by their courts. 
So there is some positive selection into revolving door. And these guys, they're highly sought after on the labor market. So many of them, when they quit, they get directly offered partnerships by major law firms. And if you talk to lawyers about this revolving door problem, you hear a lot of bitterness from them. And they just complain how hard it is to win a case against a revolving door lawyer. So people believe that the playing field is being tilted by the existence of these guys. And finally, in 2016, there was a big judge quarter reform in China, which basically fired nearly half of the low quality judges in the country. And many of those people, when they got fired, they have no choice, they have no, no other option but to practice as lawyers. So there is also some passive negative selection going on at the same time. And the, people's, uh, the Supreme People's Court was very aware of this problem from the beginning. So in the early 2000s, they already issued very stringent regulation on paper against the revolving door practice. But in reality, this was never strictly enforced until very recently. So in our data, we can verify that you know, they didn't really enforce their regulations against the revolving door. Another clarification question, Xiaoda. Yeah. Xiao what would be the roughly the monthly salary jumped when they switch? It's a, an increase by five to six times, at least. Thank you. Because this is a, the average lawyer earns five times more than the average judge. But when the judges quit, they are not the average lawyer, right? They become a partner or even, even higher. So, you know, it's at least five to six times increase. Okay, so in the paper, you know, we use several different sources of data, but the main data set that we rely on is the uh, 140 million court judgment files publicized on the internet, from which we identify 11 million criminal lawsuits, 86 million commercial lawsuits, from which we also identify the universities of judges, lawyers, law firms, and litigants in China that were active over the past, for, uh, past decade. And so basically we identify about 200,000 active judges, more than half a million active lawyers, 37,000 uh, law firms, and they serve about 5 million uh, firm litigants. So with the data, the first empirical task we face is to identify those revolving door lawyers. And so the first cut approach we use is that we just look at the judges who suddenly stopped ruling cases during our simple period. And then we use their names to match them to the lawyers who suddenly started arguing cases shortly afterwards. So we use Chinese names to match disappearing judges to emerging lawyers. And of course, the concern here is that, you know, there are some Chinese names that, that are very common. So for example, when we grow up, we all know like 10 different people named Liu Chang, right? So if you have a very repetitive name, this matching can be dubious. So we draw up all the very common Chinese names, just use names that can hardly be repetitive. And the, 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 the pattern is very robust to choosing different time windows between judge disappearance and, and lawyer uh, emergence. And to be very conservative, here we construct a very conservative sample where we require that in addition to name matching, we need to use at least one additional source of information to verify the revolving door. So to give you an idea of what we do, let's look at one example. So here uh, on the left, we have a court judgment file in Henan province in 2016. And here you can see the name of the judge is Fu Qinbin. And this judge disappeared after this case. He never handled another case as a judge. But two years later, as you can see on the right, there's another court judgment file in Henan where the lawyer is named Fu Qinbin. And he serves for this uh, law firm, Henan Guoji Lu Shi Shu And because Fu Qinbin is not a very common Chinese name, we think this is very likely to be the same person. But to be sure, we verify using other sources. So first we go to Baidu Baike, which is a Chinese version of Wikipedia. And most judges have their Wikipedia entries. So you can see, you know, there's an entry for Fu Qinbin saying, you know, he was a judge, but now he works for this law firm as a lawyer. And then we go to the official website of that law firm. We can see that law firm bragging about their new hire of a superstar lawyer who used to be a judge in, in Henan province. So that basically tells us, you know, we got it right. So we do this for every case that we match based on name. And for half of the name matching, we can further verify using additional information. And in either sample, we actually get very similar point estimates, which suggests that you know, name matching actually alone already does a quite decent job in identifying those guys. Okay, so with the data, let me show you some very simple summary statistics. So first we can look at the time trend of revolving door lawyers. You can see this was increasing very quickly as then it decreased in the recent years which is consistent with the timing of government regulations in the past two years. And especially you can see this revolving door lawyers, they concentrate in the economically more developed areas. So there are many judges who quit in the Western provinces 
but they choose to go to Beijing and Shanghai to be lawyers because these are the places where you have more lucrative cases. Uh, Shada, let me remind you, you have five more minutes. Okay. Um, and, and here, you know, we can look at the selection pattern of uh, these lawyers. So, so here we construct two proxies for their ability. One is, you know, how many high stake cases they handle. A uh, second is, you know, how, how often do they get appealed against? And in both uh, proxies, you see that, you know, both the really high ability judges and the really low ability judges are more likely to quit, and the mediocre ones are more likely to stay. So there is a bimodal pattern of selection, right? positive and negative selection going on at the same time. Okay, now let me talk about some uh, empirical analysis. So first we want to know whether those revolving the lawyers deliver better judicial outcomes. So we match identical cases to each other, and then we, within each group of identical cases, we compare the rulings with and without a good lawyer. Right, conditional on case group fixed effect, card fixed effect, and, and, and year fixed effect. And so the credibility of this, of course, hinges on the quality of matching identical cases to each other. So here we focus on two types of very sharp, uh, well, well defined cases. Right, for example, we look at long contract disputes. We extract all the quantitative features that define this dispute. Right, we have the size of the loan, interest rate, continuation rate, duration of repayment, overdue charges, so on and so forth. Conditional, those things being matched, we have two identical contracts. And then, uh, if it's a non repayment issue, we know those two cases are identical cases. Similarly, we can define identical cases for sales contract disputes. Uh, we can use big language models to verify that this matching actually does a great job in uh, identifying similar cases. And here I give you two examples of identical loan contract disputes. You see they have almost identical loan contract details for almost every dimension, and they have the exact same violation, and the plaintiffs make very similar claims. And they even got written using the same template. And so this is the kind of variation that we use. And using this variation, we see that, you know, in otherwise identical cases, a good lawyer delivers much better judicial outcomes for both the plaintiff and the defendant in both loan contract disputes and in sales contract disputes. It increases the win rate by 11 to 15 percent. And these two types of cases alone already account for 45 percent of all the commercial lawsuits in China. So we're capturing a very large share of the economy. And you can imagine that you know, for the more complicated cases, the return to lawyers may be even larger given the larger wiggle room. And here, one concern is that you know, maybe the, the really rich people hire the good lawyers. And in addition to relying on the lawyers, the rich people also exert their own influence on judicial outcomes. So to try to address that, we control for a very demanding court by litigant fixed effect. So we look at the firms that get involved in many similar cases in the same court. And then within that, we compare the role of good lawyers versus bad lawyers, we see the same thing. So this is really coming from lawyers rather than the clients. Okay, so given that you know the good lawyers deliver really good outcomes, we want to know where does that come from, whether it's no who or it's no how. So we have some suggestive evidence for no how. We see that you know those revolving door lawyers, they're still better than other lawyers, even in their away cards where they don't have a lot of connection. And that edge in away cards does not diminish as you move farther away from your home court. So that's consistent with better legal knowledge rather than uh, better personal connections. And similarly, you know, this gap in away courts can be predicted by the education and the expertise of the judge. And then for know who, we have a sharper test, right? We can control for a lawyer fixed effect and compare within the same lawyer what's your performance at home versus away court. And we see the same revolving door lawyer, when he goes to his home court, he becomes even more effective. But this is only true when he argues in front of a former colleague. Right? If he goes to his home court, but argues in front of a new, new uh, judge that like arrived after his departure, then there is no additional effectiveness. So this is really about knowing the specific judge rather than having local knowledge. And finally, in the third part of the paper, we try to zoom out from this micro level impacts of lawyers on their clients and think about the societal impacts of these good lawyers. And so the idea is that, you know, those good lawyers, they can, on the one hand, create a positive externality by presenting better information to help the judge. But on the, on the other hand, they strategically present biased information to help their clients win more. And we try to identify these two different moments, positive and negative externalities. So the way we do that is that we look at a group of negative cases, we divide them into three categories. The category where you have two good lawyers against each other, the category where you have two bad lawyers against each other, the category where you have a good lawyer against a bad lawyer. So when you have two good lawyers against each other, the negative externality cancels out. You have twice the amount of positive externality. 
So if you compare case one to case two, you can identify positive externality. And then if you compare case three to case two, you have the net effect of positive minus negative externality. So that's how we separate those two moments. Empirically, we draw this very big figure where you have thousands of very thin lines. Each thin line is a group of identical cases. You can think of this, you know, thousands of uh, you know, identical long contract disputes. And within each thin line, we have three segments. Two good lawyers against each other, two bad lawyers against each other, good lawyer against bad lawyer. And the color of this line segment represents the standard deviation in rulings for these otherwise identical cases. If the color is darker, that means standard deviation is larger, ruling is more dispersed. If the color is lighter, that means ruling is more consistent, consistent, dispersion is smaller. So what you see that the first column is lighter than the second column, which means there is indeed a positive spill rate, positive actionality. So by presenting better information, you can reduce the dispersion in rulings for identical cases. If you compare the third column to the second column, you see the third column is even darker than the second column, which means that you know, negative externality actually more than offsets positive externality in this case, and when a good lawyer faces a bad lawyer. And because we only have so few good lawyers in society, they almost always face bad lawyers, which means that you know, on night, a good lawyer actually creates more harm than good to the society. And we show that these lawyers, they're also not class neutral. They disproportionately serve the rich individuals and the big corporations. So in addition to biasing the information, they also exacerbate existing socioeconomic inequalities. So just to very quickly conclude, in the paper we show that you know, those good lawyers, they deliver fantastic outcomes for their clients that comes from both their legal knowledge, know-how, and their connections, know-who. And for the society, on the one hand, they present better information to reduce ruling dispersion, but on the other hand, they present biased information to improve, uh, to, to increase ruling dispersion, and they also exacerbate existing inequalities. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Shodan. Actually, Jonah just sent me a message, and he may not need 25 minutes. He would like to share you five more minutes. But you use I I, two I minutes. I didn't know that. I okay, maybe we keep those time for discussion. So the discussant is uh, jo Professor Jonah Jebek from the UC Berkeley, and uh, you have roughly 20 to 25 minutes. And Jonah, please go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me and see the, you can see yeah, the screen? Yeah, you can see, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so uh, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, what a what a cool thing to get to do. Um, I've never actually had to put a date on a cover slide before that was a different date for me than uh, where the uh, where the talk was happening. So uh, always, uh, always happy to have a first. Um, okay, so uh, the first thing I want to do is just give my kind of overall take uh, about the paper, um, some kind of broad reactions. So the, the, this is a super interesting paper. I mean, it um, uh, it has remarkable data. It's huge. Uh, the 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 data of judgments that is the kind of the backbone of the paper is this huge, comprehensive, um, and interesting data set. Um, there's an enormous amount of work that went into uh, getting information about judges and lawyers. Um, and, uh, and and names. I mean, um, Shaudan talked a bunch about that uh, in the talk, and I'm actually really glad um, that he did because uh, I, I think you wouldn't appreciate how much work went into it if you hadn't uh, hadn't seen all that. So I thought that was a really uh, a really nice feature of the project, and and I'm really impressed. Um, it also uh, is a paper that has uh, for those who aren't familiar with the Chinese legal system. Um, and, and I am one of those people. Uh, this was a really uh, easy, clear introduction to the Chinese legal system, the, the very basics. I'm sure that uh, I would be guilty of all sorts of malpractice if I ever tried to get involved at this stage. But just, for example, to know the structure of the four types of courts, the way that judges' careers work, that's not at all the way things work in the United States. Uh, the, the multiple level courts has some similarities, but not the judge's career parts. So I think for those who don't know much about the Chinese legal system, uh, either because you don't know that much about China like me, or because you don't know that much about legal systems generally, um, this is a really, a, a really nice, gentle introduction. I also really like the way the paper takes seriously economic theories uh, and their connection to law. The three different ideas of, okay, first does 
the type of lawyer you hire matter at all? I mean, does that show up in win rates? Uh, that's sort of an obvious first order question to ask. I think a lot of people would have stopped there. But then this idea of comparing the know-how to know-who, I thought was a really nice uh, feature. And then the ruling dispersion part, that that really cool heat map, which by the way, I think is like a really smart way to, uh, to summarize a complex set of results. I don't know how obvious it was. Uh, people might've missed it as Shada was um, going through somewhat quickly at the end, but each row of that uh, heat map graph corresponded to a particular type of case essentially. And so there are many, many, many rows and the I, I gather that the left side of it, as you looked at it, is the is is sorted. That's the both uh, both sides have a, a revolving door lawyer group, and and that seemed to be sorted from least dispersion to most. And the fact that the other two were so much darker, um, I think it's just really and 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 it didn't seem especially correlated either with the order of the left side. I think it's just really powerful and compelling. It's obviously not a formal statistical test, um, and I assume that something like that is coming. But or or maybe it's there and I missed it. But I thought that was a really really nice way to summarize and present some pretty complicated to explain data. So I thought that was a really nice feature as well. Really nice uh, connection of economic theory uh, to law. Um, and let me get now to some uh, details. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about uh, just really briefly because this is not uh, for the most part a U.S. crowd uh, is just how incredible the data set is that this universe of judgments is 144 million judgments um in principle anyway in this and, and i guess you you've had access to all of them there's some uh change over time i think and uh, from what i've gleaned today and in, in checking into this um there's been some that cases that have been removed over time and it's unclear what the long run status of this website is going to be where the scraping was done but it's really an incredible data set it makes it possible to identify the interesting variation here off these like comparatively teeny fractions of lawyers and judges, which still give you very large N from a statistical point of view, just because it's such a massive source of data. So I'm just a huge fan of that. I think it was really uh, a, a very clever idea. I'm looking only at the judges who aren't in the, whose last names aren't in the 1000 most common was a really smart way to deal with the problem of, of bad matches. And you could just could not have done anything like that with a data set that wasn't uh, massive like this. So um, absolutely a great uh, way to go. Um, a, a quick side note, by, by the way, the picture here, this is the website. This is a screenshot of the website, um, the China Judgment Online uh, website. Um, I took this, my, I, I may have taken this from the paper, but I did visit it today as well. Um, uh, the U.S. has nothing like this. We have, and I'll just say very quickly, in the U.S., we have something called PACER, which is the Public Access to Court Electronic Records uh, website. And it really is just a website that links together a bunch of disparate federal court um, uh, databases. It's really clunky. It doesn't have anything like the degree of comprehensive data. Um, I could go on and on. I'm actually teaching a course this semester about the limited nature of public access to court records um, in the U.S., um, so this is an issue that's near and dear to my heart, um, and this would just be an impossible thing to do uh, in the United States. So uh, I thought that was just worth uh, worth noting. All right. Um, with that said, I want to turn to some uh, broader conceptual issues, and these will be kind of the main points, I think, uh, of my discussion um, worth, uh, worth paying attention to, although I'll also have a few uh, comments about the empirical execution as well. Um, so the first thing, and this to me as somebody who, so I'm a, an economist by background originally. Uh, late in life, I got interested in law and decided to go to law school. And uh, so I have some uh, expertise in both areas. The, the kind of fundamental massive issue in any uh, empirical or really theoretical study of uh, the litigation process and any attempt to use data on judgments um, is uh, this problem of settlement. Um, so <clears throat> the basic issue is if cases can settle, then the set of cases that litigate all the way to judgment, so that are tried to a verdict, um, is just necessarily selected. Uh, and there's a very famous paper by, at least famous among you know law types, uh, by uh, George Priest and uh, Ben Klein. Uh, it's 1984 paper in the Journal of Legal Studies 
the paper itself, at the risk of being uh, un, uh, unduly uh, harsh to my uh, my elders, um, the, the paper itself is not an especially uh, well executed piece of economic theory, but it does have a very clear central point that has been the focus of decades of subsequent work. Um, and that point is what I've already said, which is that um, it's necessarily the case that the set of cases that uh, go all the way to judgment is selected if settlement is allowed. Now, in the U.S., settlement is endemic. It's um, it's uh, maybe ubiquitous is too strong, but it's very, very common. Many people think like 90 percent of cases settle. I think that's not that's probably too high, but uh, it, it's a relatively small share that litigate all the way to judgment. Some of them have uh, dismissals through pretrial mechanisms and things like that. They're not settled, but they don't get all the way to a uh, to a verdict. Um, I have some recent work. Um, I, I guess in, in the interest of plugging my own stuff, I'll just mention this. Um, this paper might be of some interest, um, depending on the uh, role of settlement in Chinese uh, litigation, which I, I know nothing about, um, as I uh, as my earlier comments probably suggest. Um, but one of the points of my paper. Um, which is purely a theory paper, there's no data in it, um, is uh, to show that essentially any win rate can happen um, it, uh, when, uh, in, in the case, set of cases that are uh, that are litigated to judgment, um, when there's uh, no real constraints or limits on the nature of settlement. And it, it's somewhat easy and complicated both to make this point. Uh, so I would just encourage you to take a quick look anyway at that paper. I'm not the only one to make that point, although I think I, in some ways, the way that my paper makes that point is somewhat more sophisticated uh, it, and will probably look more familiar to uh, contemporary econometrician type um, than some of the earlier stuff. Uh, and then I make some other points that might be useful uh, to think about. So I'm not looking for a citation or anything. I just think it's worth thinking about this issue. Um, so the, the paper today, let me get back to that. It doesn't say anything about settlement. So I still don't know anything, or at least if it did, I missed it. I still don't know anything about how settlement works, if it works at all, in the Chinese legal system. Um, so I, it, if it does happen, so, so for example, in the United States, some cases uh, can't settle unless there's a judicial approval of the settlement for fairness reasons. That Those are typically class actions or some other form of what's known as representative litigation. But in your standard plaintiff versus defendant, a loan contract case, a sales contract case, uh, those can settle. And in the US anyway, if they settle, they might just disappear from the docket in a way that just makes it impossible to know um, that they settled. We certainly in the US never observe the amount for which a case settled if it settled, which is makes it really, really hard to do anything kind of interesting empirically um, about settlement beyond whether it happened um, in the US. So I wonder, are we seeing only non-settled cases? Are there settled cases? What fraction of them settle? Um, you know, and, and I think, I, I hate to say this um, because you've already done so much work, but I think that if there's, if settlement is something that can just kind of happen as part of a bargaining, a standard bargaining uh, process, then I think you're going to have to think really carefully about the selection mechanism that settlement represents. Um, there are a zillion different papers in the U.S. and uh, British literature on the nature of settlement bargaining and different equilibria. And basically, nobody really knows the like right way to do it. It's complicated. It's probably the case. If you ask me, I would say there's probably 30 different types of, you know, settlement negotiations out there. Um, and, and you know, some some cases have one type and others have a different type. And uh, I don't think anybody really knows how to identify any of that. So I think that's just a, um, a th that's my one uh, thing about the paper where, you know, I, I would be worried. Um, and so I think you're just going to, you get any law and economics person as a referee at any journal, they're going to be like, what about settlement? So uh, that, that'd that be like the first order thing I would be thinking about. Okay. So I've beaten that horse well and dead. So let me move on um, to a couple of other uh, conceptual points. Um, so one is just sort of a minor thing. I mean, I, I don't think the model is like, this. this isn't you are going to do structural work um, with moments of the data, um, but I, I get the sense that the model is kind of there as a kind of like guide, not a, not a, this isn't a general equilibrium model that's being like estimated for policy reasons or something like that. 
Um, having said that, judgments in the model are binary. Either the plaintiff wins or the defendant wins. There's no middle ground. That's the model. And, and I think, um, I don't know this uh, myself, but I think that's uh, adopted from Duatrapont and uh, and Tarol. Is that right? You, you basically just adopted their model for this setting. So um, maybe their model can be, maybe that model can be um, generalized in a way uh, to handle the fact that unless I've misunderstood, the data are not defined in this binary plaintiff wins or defendant wins kind of way. Um, it isn't the case that the uh, outcome variable is binary which side won, but rather it's the um, win share of the party. And I think, I'm not sure that uh, Shada had a uh, chance to mention this detail, but um, the party's win share is the opponent's share of court costs um, as a fraction of the total court cost, if I understand correctly. So um, a defendant who wins 100%, what that means is that the plaintiff will be observed to have been uh, forced to pay 100% of the costs of the case. If the parties are evenly split, then I think they each pay 50%. Is that right? I, shout out, do I have? I, okay, good. So then anything above 50 but below 100 is like a partial win, right? And, and the court can determine which way that goes. Quick parenthetical, in the US, this is another thing that we would never see because we have what's called, fittingly, the American rule, which is each side pays its own uh, its own litigation costs with a few exceptions that aren't worth going into right now. In, in China, uh, it turns out that um, the rule is the what's often called the English rule, but really it should just be called the non-American rule because I think almost every other country in the world uses the non-American rule. Um, and we could have a long conversation about the results of that kind of thing as well. I won't, uh, I'll just leave it there. It is a nice feature that it allows the data to be used in this uh, clever way to measure what the court must have thought was the win percentage essentially of each side. But just again, this is a mismatch with respect to the uh, with respect to the model. And I don't know, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe the model can just be thought of probabilistically and that would be that. Uh, but uh, but I think it's, um, sorry, non-probabilistically, but rather uh, as a continuous fraction rather than a, a alpha being the probability that one side wins in the model, maybe alpha is just how much the side wins or something. It just strikes me that that's something worth at least attending to um, uh, in the discussion. Um, a, a more substantive point um, has to do with this approach of using conditioning on all the, I think the term that uh, you use in the paper and also in the pr uh, presentation was all the legally relevant details. So like the interest rate and the uh, punishment charge or something like that, I forget the exact term. Um, yeah, I have some of the mere monetary size of the loan, interest rate, the duration of repayment. Um, so that's a really cool feature that you can condition on all of these things about um, the loan uh, or sales contract at issue because it takes away the concern that uh, unobservables are are driving things. And, and if unobservables aren't driving things, um, then they can't be correlated with having a revolving door lawyer. And so that tends to make one feel better about the, um, about the uh, uh, identification here. Um, however, I, I'm, I'm a little bit less convinced maybe than the authors that uh, conditioning on these details, the, the ones that are available, renders cases identical from a legal perspective. I can't help but wonder why are there disputes then um, in lawsuits? Like if everybody agrees on all of these facts and everybody can see what they are, um, and this, by the way, is why cases tend to settle. Uh, and uh, in the it's the usual argument is like, well, you know, if everybody agrees, why go to the trouble of paying lawyers and risking that the court will make you pay and um, for the other side's lawyer and so on? Just just like settle the dispute. Um, and so it must be at some basic level uh, that there are some other unobserved facts um, in, uh, in, in cases that, that end up getting tried or, or, or filed anyway in, in court and presumably then tried. Um, you know, what about the question of whether the contract was actually signed? Like may maybe there's a dispute over whether there was really a contract. Um, maybe there's a dispute over whether payment was actually made. These things are, I think, going to be unobservables given the set of information that's available. That's not, not through any fault of the authors. It's just the nature of the, the situation. Um, and so uh, I wonder, uh, I wonder um, uh, whether we have to worry about whether these kinds of unobservables, which are the remaining ones, uh, would be, you know, sort of like importantly correlated with uh, revolving door variation. 
I, I think that's the argument you need to be making, not that these are identical from a legal perspective, but rather that the unobservables that are left are unlikely to be essentially correlated with having revolving door lawyers. Um, okay, so... Um, uh, do final... I, uh, sorry for the interference. Uh, I think there's three minutes left. Great, that's just what I need. Um, so uh, the, uh, the uh, paper's third motivation, this one with the ruling dispersion, um, presumes that the information lawyers provide is good. I, I hate to, you know, speak ill of my uh, of my kind, but um, that can be wrong, right? Like good lawyers might be good partly because they're really good at using evidence rules. Um, and the whole point, at least in the U.S., of evidence rules is about excluding relevant information. It's not about presenting um, better, uh, true information. Anybody can get true and relevant evidence in as long as it doesn't have some other problem. Um, the the like really good move is to figure out how to keep it out uh, some of the time anyway. Um, and so I think it's just maybe worth thinking about the possibility that uh, maybe the argument against lawyers in in your kind of context is stronger um, conceptually than the way you uh, you, phrased, you you um, phrased it. Uh, okay, uh, I'm not sure why that check mark is on my screen now, but I'm just gonna go with it. Um, I don't know if you all can see it. Uh, so a couple of quick points uh, about empirical issues, um, given that I'm uh, almost out of time. Um, the paper is very early stage. I definitely think you could provide more information on how you got from 144 million cases like down to the few hundred thousand. Like that, I think, is just really a necessity. Um, and again, I know it's really early stage, but that I, I so I assume you're already planning to do that. But um, I think some uh, some clarity on that would be um, really useful. Um, I, I wanted to just make one last point and then I'll stop, which is this is table one, um, which is the the table that's about whether um, whether revolving door lawyers help at all, right? Like wh whether they have an impact. So I want to point out uh, column one is um, where we're looking at defendant's win rate. So the defendant has a revolving door lawyer. Column three is the plaintiff's win rate. These are both loan contract cases where the uh, plaintiff is the one, I take it, who has a revolving door lawyer. Um, and I just want to point out that these are very, very different estimates. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. Like, what what is it that uh, explains that? And maybe one explanation is that maybe they're not that different because they're the plaintiffs just end up paying more. Um, it looks like as a baseline matter. So that's interesting in its own right. And I'd like to know a little bit more about that. And so I started thinking about that issue. And then I noticed that there's like twice as many cases where plaintiffs have revolving door lawyers as uh, defendants do. And that made me realize that these are not the same cases, obviously, because it's one party versus the other having. And that made me think about, well, how do we think about the possibility that these are just maybe heterogeneous in important ways, um, in important ways. Um, and so, uh, you know, are these really apples to apples comparisons or is there something else going on that helps explain why sometimes defendants have revolving door lawyers and sometimes plaintiffs do? And maybe they're not the same types of cases where it makes sense uh, for one side or the other to have. I'm not sure how much progress you can make about that, but I think it's at least worth addressing the possibility that that might be uh, one thing to think about. And, and just more broadly, being really clear for your audience that um, that these are not all one set of cases, which is obvious once one thinks about it, but not, it, not stated in the paper, if I remember. Um, so I had a couple of other minor comments, but I'm just gonna stop there so that uh, there'll be time for discussion. Okay, thanks, Shona. And now let's see whether we currently have any uh, quick questions. And if no quick questions, maybe Shota could uh, first respond yeah. to Jonas. Yeah, can uh, I very quickly respond? Well. Those. First, I want to really uh, thank Professor Gaubak for taking the time to read through our extremely preliminary uh, draft that you know I was teaching. I took like a few days to put things together. So it's very much incomplete and, and you know, there are many great points being, being raised here. I just want to very quickly respond to a few of those. So first, the issue on settlement is definitely very important. And you know, we've been thinking about it a lot. We just haven't got time to really uh, elaborate on that in the draft. So the way we think about this is uh, you know, in several ways. One is that you know, settlement is, is very important. And nowadays, it's actually becoming a political priority for the local courts in China because the president encouraged the, case, the, the local courts to settle more cases. And they try everything they can to settle cases. But overall, settlement rate is quite low in China. It's only 20%, much lower than in other settings. And we don't know why. We actually have a field experiment ongoing trying to figure out you know, how to increase that settlement rate. Um, that said, you know, I think in our specific setting, there are two reasons that make, make us a little bit less worried about the company factor of settlement. So first is that 
the, the, the first cut approach is mainly a selection of observable approach. So it is okay that, you know, there's a lot of selection at the settlement stage. It's okay that, you know, selected cases enter into the trial process and go through with the entire trial and get the rulings. That's totally fine, right? We're saying that within this pool of selected cases, we match identical cases to each other, and then we identify the role of lawyers. So, so it's not really confounded by the pre-existing selection uh, in settlement. That's one thing. The other thing is that, you know, to the extent that we, we do want to think about the influence of settlement, you know, if you have a good lawyer, right, that makes you more powerful in trial. And if you're rational, you anticipate that bargaining power in trial, that translates into a bargaining power in the settlement discussion. That also makes you get more favorable terms in the settlement. So yeah, if anything, you know, those two things should also work toward the same direction. That's another reason you know, why we're probably a little bit less concerned about this. So that, that's settlement. And, and then on the model, you know, related, related to your comment on you know, the outcome being binary or you know, continuous, you know, you're right. So, so right now we just you know, build a simple model based on the existing framework where we have a binary outcome as a conceptual framework. But eventually, if we, we want to simulate that, you know, we can easily make that continuous. So, so it's, it's not super uh, difficult for us to do. And then, you know, about the, the loan contract dispute. And so I think the, 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 the so, so here, I think the reason why, you know, so, so we think we're able to match analytical loan contract disputes to each other. As you mentioned, you know, there are other things like, you know, whether we actually can still find the contract as evidence, whether we actually have any disagreement on whether there exists a contract. Those things are in the court judgment file as well. So we can observe those features as well when we do the matching. And I think, it's a good question you ask, like, you know, if those two cases are really identical, and then, you know, what's uncertain, what kind of uncertainty makes them go to lawsuit in the first place? So my understanding is that the uncertainty here is their difference in beliefs about rulings. And that's the feature of China. You see similar cases get ruled very differently. Unlike in the US, where, you know, you have, you have a, uh, you know, legally binding president, similar cases would have smaller dispersion. So, you know, even if you have the same case, you think, you know, you may get a favorable ruling, I think I may get a favorable ruling, that disagreement still makes us go to trial. And I think that's probably, you know, a, a main factor at play here. And then, um, and then the final thing on, you know, even if, you know, suppose there is some selection that we don't observe, right? some unobservable features that, uh, you know, match specific cases to the revolving door lawyers than, uh, you know, other lawyers, that kind of selection is still most likely going to work against our findings, right? Because, you know, if you have a hard case, you give that to the good lawyer. But if you have a very simple case, you give that to a more ordinary lawyer. So if that's the case, then, you know, what we're seeing is that, you know, even if there's an unobservable, we are observing that the good lawyers take a harder case and then still get better rulings than the ordinary lawyers taking an easier case. So then lawyers will be even more effective uh, in that case. Yeah, so it's just some some quick thoughts, but you know, thanks so much for the comments, and we'll think more carefully about those. Okay, thanks a lot. Let, let's see. I think we we probably have a lot of questions from the floor, yeah. and uh, questions to our audience. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll ask the question first. Uh, so I I want to say. Uh, first of all, really thank you a lot for for Shouter and also for Jonah. I learned a lot in this session. It's the second time I heard the paper. I pick up a lot more. Thank you to both of you. I want to ask the following two questions. As I understand it, in China, there's really a court congestion case because of lack of uh, adequate uh, judges and so on. And so there are cases that do not get accepted. Um, so I wonder if you have a good lawyer with that help or uh, help to, to have a case to get into court or uh, or it doesn't resolve the congestion issue. Um, the second question I have is, um, the, the question I have is about your heat map. You have the, the revolving door versus the non-revolving door, but you bind the two kinds of cases uh, together, meaning the revolving door can represent the pontiff or it can represent the defendants. What if you separate them uh, into two? Do you still see the, the more uh, dense the heat map? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. First, thanks for uh, inviting me and thanks for you know, bearing with me for a second time uh, with this paper. 
And uh, on the two questions, right? The first question is that uh, I have to interrupt. Carbon. I say enjoy it more, a lot more this time. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So uh, regarding car congestion, actually, China doesn't have a very severe issue with car congestion, unlike many other developing countries. Like in countries like India, you have very long congestion. It takes forever for kids to get ruled. And China actually has one of the fastest uh, judicial system in the world. And if you look at the, the case load of every judge, it, it's kind of ridiculous uh, compared to what you see. Uh, in more developed countries, and you know, regarding you know whether some cases can get filed in the first place or not, so there was actually a history in this. So about a decade ago, there were many cases that the local courts don't take, and then they had a big reform. Basically, said that you know, as long as you have the necessary materials, the case has to be established. You know, you cannot deny a case. And after that, you see a skyrocketing of case load, and then the government attached incentives to local courts, saying you know. Your KPI is to handle more cases. So if you handle more cases, you're more successful. So courts were trying very hard to even invite more cases to come. And that was the case until two years ago when Xi Jinping announced that, you know, we want to settle more cases. We shouldn't have so many trials. So now the, the courts have the opposite incentive. When people try to file a case, they, they try to discourage them, say, you know, why don't you go through this mediation process? If that, that doesn't work, then you can go to trial. So, so it changed over time. But basically, you know, as nowadays, if you want to go to trial, you can't go to trial. You just need to bear with the mediation process. So, so the, the lawyer doesn't really, you know, play a big role in that part. But my question is like, uh, does the lawyer, a good lawyer, uh, affect this process? So a, a good lawyer can affect the mediation process a little bit. So I think that relates to the common uh, settlement, right? If you have a good lawyer, the good lawyer can, can go to the mediation on your behalf. Yeah, but so, so in, that case, in that case, it affects the selection into trial in the first place. Yeah, so but but the, what, the, the issue is to slot the, the case into the right process, into the right mode. In pro, uh, a settlement um, before you, you go to court, intermediation, and actually it is really worth going to court. So it's about whether the good lawyer lead to the right judgment, socially speaking. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, so so no, that, that's a great point. So I think we, we couldn't say anything very concrete about that because we don't really observe the settlement process. We mostly, as Jonah pointed out, we mostly observe the eventual rulings. So there is a big missing part in the data, but conceptually we can, you know, think about the direction of things. And, you know, if you have a good lawyer, you get more favorable rulings in the trial. And you know that when you have the mediation. So that gives you stronger bargaining power. So that also helps you get better terms in settlement. So theoretically, those things should work toward the same direction. So you know what we find in the trial process should be indicative of you know what happens in the settlement process, but we couldn't say anything really quantitative about the settlement process. Yeah. So so uh, that's uh, that's the first thing. Can you remind me what's the second question? Sorry, I, I forgot a little. Uh, Bernie, you, your mic muted. In your in your in your third column in the oh, heat, the heat map, map. I, I remember. right. So if I take. The, uh, the the revolving door versus the non-revolving door cases mm -hmm. and differentiate them into um, defending uh, uh, and then also into uh, interpretive. So what, what would the heat map look yes. like? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So we actually have that figure. We didn't put it in the slides because it takes too much time to explain that. But basically, you know, we did that. You know, if revolving the lawyer represents plaintiff or if revolving the lawyer represents defendant, we, we have like four different groups. And in that case, when they represent either you know plaintiff or defendant on you know, one side, so these two groups they actually have small smaller standard deviation compared to the case where you have two bad lawyers. Okay. Uh, so so they're so powerful that okay. you they always okay. dominate that that weak guy. So if they represent one side, the deviation becomes even smaller. But in reality, because sometimes they represent this side, sometimes they represent the other side, they actually create a very big dispersion. Okay, let's see any other. Questions? Uh, uh, just uh, some questions. There was a one slide uh, showing that recently this revolving door door goes down. Mm -hmm. There was a one slide I noticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah there is a slide. Uh, and I really would like to get a sense of uh, what's current situation. Yeah. Um, on these legal form. Yes. And also that uh, maybe that the. Uh, <laughs> Some topics for future people, future researchers who are here that are listening to your talk. Yes, yes. So, so basically, uh, what happened is that 
from the early 2000s, the central government was already aware of this problem. At that time, there were already judges quitting to be lawyers. So they issued very stringent regulation on paper, saying that you know if you quit, you need to stay for two years before you can practice as a lawyer. And then even if you practice, you can only go to other provinces. You cannot be in your home court. So very stringent regulation on paper. But this was never enforced for two decades. Until 2021, they decided to end this revolving door thing. So the Supreme People's Court sent central inspection teams to local court, explicitly saying that we're going to target the revolving door problem. And in data, you see that you know after 2021, the trend of revolving door basically went down. So because you know the, the return to doing this is smaller, you need to wait for two years, you need to go to other places, you cannot capitalize fully on your social capital. So that's why you know, things went down more recently. Okay. Uh, so that can I ask some questions? Um, indeed, you show very interesting results. Uh, revolving door law, lawyers uh, have a higher success rate in winning. Uh, I wonder whether this is just because of their skills or connections or just due to their cherry picking selection issues. Uh, I know that for most likely the, the lawyers will be hired by the by those firms, most likely they will take it, right? But sometimes for difficult cases, for the those cases, and um, likely to fail. So do you think that those revolving door lawyers, because they are they have more experience, and then in that case, they are more likely to say no. So no, if, for sure, like definitely lawyers don't randomly take cases. Yeah. Right. So so you know they definitely pick and, and choose uh, when they take those cases. But I think the, the, the main point of our first card empirical strategy is that, you know, we're looking at a subset of very, very well defined cases, right? Loan contract dispute or sales contract dispute. And those cases are defined entirely by some really quantifiable features that we can observe in the data. Right? So, so, you know, for example, a loan contract dispute, you know, the size of the loan, the interest rate, the overdue rate, the repayment period, so on and so forth. So there's nothing else in that contract. It's just, you know, I, I borrow money from you. We have those terms and I didn't give anything back. And then we agree on evidence. We can see that in the court judgment file. So nobody disputes on evidence on the contract, so on and so forth. Then, you know, it's very well defined case. So definitely, you know, there are many other cases that those revolving door lawyers take that would differ from the other cases that ordinary lawyers take. But we take the subset of overlap cases between those two groups, which are identical. And we just compare that common support to each other. So we're not trying to say things about other cases because, you know, definitely they have selection. And one way to think about this is that, you know, this kind of loan contract dispute is kind of trivial and it's not super lucrative. So those big name revolving the lawyers, they don't really want to take them. But we see many of them do this anyways, because you know, when they get hired by a big law firm as a partner, they need to serve a big firm client like Tencent or you know, Alibaba. And then you know, the Tencent gets involved in all kinds of cases. The revolving the lawyers want the lucrative cases, but they cannot say, you know, I don't take all the small cases from you. They need to do everything for that firm. So basically, you know, these cases are kind of passively given to them and they need to take that. So we actually have an alternative empirical strategies that we're working on where, you know, we look at an even study of a firm getting a new revolving door lawyer and then the existing client of that firm, which takes out the selection, benefits from the arrival of this new powerful lawyer for all their cases. And so, so that's, you know, trying to directly address this in a bit more concrete way. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I think the GV uh, Chen has uh, some questions. Uh, you can yeah. unmute Mac. Yeah, ask yeah I also have a similar uh, selection questions uh, regarding to judge. You know, so um, a few years ago, there was a um, round of reform regarding to the Rianerji Gaiga. So the judge should be prof professionalization. Uh, in many courts, uh, you have to uh, select a few people, capable people to be judged that other people may, uh, you know, yeah. marginalized into other. Uh, duties in the in the in the court. So I wonder whether this kind of reform will change the selection process. So so not necessarily this selection process uh, totally based on you know ability. In many cases it depends on age. You know, the, you know some people are all their education background. So in that case, the uh, selection process uh, may be a little bit different from the only uh, ability driven uh, exactly so so that's that reform is exactly what we mean by saying uh, there was a judge quarter reform in 2016 so basically uh, in Chinese it's called 原额制改革. 
So basically, that reform side, you know, we're going to fire nearly half of the, the low quality judges in the country. Uh, low quality was defined as, you know, they didn't go to law school, they couldn't pass this exam. So mostly it targeted the older generation because, you know, at that time there were veterans becoming judges. They don't know anything about law. So those guys, they couldn't get the judge quota and they get marginalized. Either, you know, they work as a court clerk or they just, you know, leave the court to practice as a lawyer. And that's exactly why in the data we see there is a bimodal pattern of selection. Yeah, the, the, the top judges who handle very important cases, who, who went to graduate school, they quit because they have better outside option. And then on the other tail, you have uh, those lower quality judges who didn't go to graduate school, who didn't go to law school, who don't handle good cases. They quit because they were pushed out by the judge quarter reform. So we do observe that in the data. And the one result that I didn't have time to show is that actually both the know how and know who effect tend to be stronger for the positively selected judges. And so the negative ones, they're weaker in both dimensions, which suggests that, you know, know how, know who are actually complements rather than substitutes of each other in this setting. Thank you. Okay, I think it's 30. Do you have yeah. a question? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, Shada, this is a very interesting paper. Um, so, so you kind of take a ex post approach by focusing on, you know, when a dispute arises, um, so how would a revolving judges would have a differential impact on the case outcomes? Um, so I was wondering to what extent they would have ex ante impact on the way these loans or sales contracts are designed? And and how would this ex ante impact affect on the ex post outcome? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I think there, there are two parts of ex ante impact. One part is you know what we discussed earlier about you know settlement, mediation, so on and so forth. So that's likely going to work toward the same direction as you know, what they do in the rulings because they increase your bargaining power. But I think you raise a different point about, you know, ex ante, you can also just make the, the contract better, more scientific or, you know, uh, so, so that you, we, we wouldn't have, have any dispute in the first place. So I think that's definitely part of what's going on, but, you know, it, it wouldn't directly affect our results because we are focusing on a very standard type of case, right? You know, long contract dispute. The contract is perfect. Everyone uses this exact same contract. They just change the numbers a little bit. There's a template that everyone uses. So, so for that part, I think, you know, they probably don't do much, but I think more broadly, uh, in reality, when they work for Tencent, when they do IPO cases, those lawyers definitely help streamline the whole thing, you know, pay attention to details to avoid the bugs in the contracts so and so forth. So I think they definitely do that and we're not able to capture that. So I think, you know, we're capturing the law and economics of lawyers in court, but, you know, they play all those non-litigation roles that we don't have right now, but those are very interesting to study. And we actually talked about this a little bit because in all the IPO documents, you can see the names of the lawyers that can be matched to all those data. But, but then, you know, we, we don't really know what the lawyers do in those IPO cases. But that, that will be something interesting to think about in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we are right on time. Uh, I would like to, before we conclude the session and then turn it back to Bernie. So I would like to invite all our audience to thank our presenter and our discussant for their great presentation and discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for making this a wonderful, lively and very educational session. Uh, thanks to the presenter again and also the discussions. I learned a lot. Uh, the next round will be in March 21st and Poria Tabi will present a paper Real effect of trade financing by export credit uh, agency. Uh, so uh, we hope to see you then again in in a month. Thank you very much. And if it's okay. not too late, enjoy your year of the dragon. Mm -hmm. right, see you. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>